good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome here this afternoon uh, for today's event. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, can I just ask everybody, as usual, to check that your mobile phones are either switched off or, or switched to silent. Our speaker today is Dr. Adrian Schult. Uh, he's a senior research fellow and also coordinator for Europe in the Klingendal Institute in The Hague. He's also a member of the EU Advisory Committee to the Dutch government. Before joining Klingendal, he served as an independent expert in the field of EU governance for the Economic and Social Committee and for the Directorate General for Research in the European Commission. And he has published numerous books and international articles on European topics. So we're very fortunate to have such a distinguished speaker today who combines a, a great wealth of experience on the functioning of the European Union with a deep knowledge of attitudes to the EU in his own country as well as in other member states. The title of his talk today is Changing Narratives, the Domestic Debate in the Netherlands on the Future of Europe. This will be of particular interest here not only in the context of this institute's work on the future of Europe, but in the wider context of the Citizens' Dialogue on the Future of Europe, which has been launched by the government and which involves a series of public consultation meetings around the country. So Dr. Schroet will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, and after that he will answer questions. And as usual, his presentation will be on the record, but the Q&A session afterwards will be off the record based on Chatham House rules. So it's now my great pleasure to invite Dr. Scoot to address us. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, uh, especially the uh, Irish Institute for getting me over. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think it's also important that we have discussions about the EU, about the future of the EU, because um, um, we have to find the sort of formulations of where are we going with the EU. We have to find our, our narratives of Europe. What, what is this animal we are uh, creating? And that is something we have to do by exchanging our discussions, as we have in the Netherlands and you have in, uh, in, in, in Ireland, and uh, particularly in our capitals, because um, our histories are different and our problems are different, so we have different views on Europe, but we still have to come up with something about a common view on the EU. And that's why I <coughs> use the title narrative. It's a bit of a esoteric term maybe, but we need to have a story. What is it that we are creating? What is it that we're working on? And we have to find a agreements over that. And, EU narrative in the Netherlands is rather different from the EU narrative in Germany or in France. <coughs> so we have to talk about it and we have to come up with a, a common lines and, and, uh, and ideas. <coughs> um, I will um, talk about the situation in the Netherlands and I'm, I'll probably say things like we, <coughs> uh, but of course there is no I'm not the spokesperson for the Netherlands, so uh, when I talk about the Netherlands or we, then you know you have to take that as a sort of in the discussion. I use that, and I know very well that Mark Rutte, our prime minister, will say one thing, but uh, the, the new minister of finance will have a, a harder line than Rutte. So you know, it really depends on the individuals. But we have to make a bit of a, a sort of impression of the Netherlands, and I'll try to do my best. Um, I've been looking at the Netherlands for a long time. I've been writing books about it, and I don't know what else. Uh, so I, I hope I have a bit of an insight into it, but it's not perfect. Uh, I'll probably make uh, four points. One is I really want to talk, say a few things about the context in which we're having this debate about the future of Europe. The, my second point will be about the EU as an institutional system that is drifting. My third point will be about the Netherlands how we look at the EU. And finally, uh, my fourth point is something that I am thinking about myself, and this is something I want to also see how we can discuss that, is uh, how can we discuss a more mature form of European integration than we are having now? 
So we really have to think about different lines of European integration, more ma mature. And I think we need Ireland for that and all the other countries. Uh, but let's start the discussion. That's where I want to end with. So about the uh, context, the context is very simple. You all know it. We have, I would almost say, enormous discussions about uh, risk sharing. A lot of the discussions are about the Eurozone, uh, but also more about deeper integration. Risk sharing is, uh, let me not go into all the, 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 the details, I'll probably, you, you, you know it. Will we get a European uh, Minister for Economic and Finance? Will we get new financial instruments, such as a rainy day fund? Do we need additional European investment funds? Uh, shall we merge presidents in the EU? Important question is, shall we have European taxes? We, we know that the proposals from the Commission that came out this week, but also we see the discussions about European taxes. They are rising. I guess we will get European taxes. But there is a line in the development of the European Parliament. The European Parliament is probably an underestimated institution. Uh, when I started working on the European integration, people told me that European Parliament is a Mickey Mouse Parliament, and Dutch civil servant told me you know, to completely ignore it. And, uh, but now the Parliament is really a very important player. With the Spitzenkandidaten 2014, it was this time it's different the slogan eh, for the elections. If that that was a game changer, the Parliament and the connection to the government the Commission. Uh, it made the Commission more political, more moving towards a, a government. If there will be European taxes, that is the last development to really make this a mature European Parliament. But that's the final game changer. Are we want to go in that direction of European taxes? So there's quite a number of very, very big questions that we have on the table now, and they have enormous consequences for the functioning of the institutions, the Commission as a political body, the European Parliament as more powerful, uh, the role of the member states and the interinstitutional balance. So we have the context is one of really serious and important questions. So now, second point is about um, the past experience, maybe from a Dutch perspective, or maybe more general, uh, about what have we seen in the, in the EU, particularly in the Eurozone, but from a Dutch perspective, the Netherlands was very much in favor of the Euro, uh, but first convergence, then the Euro. Uh, there were debates about Italy shouldn't join, Cyprus shouldn't join, Portugal not ready, Spain, etc. So yes, Euro, highly committed, but what type of order? Typically Dutch, and eh? still the Dutch talk about the order of how do we take steps. Probably not very well known, but there is a very, well, it's a B-class B hotel just outside Maastricht in Valkenburg. And in that hotel, the evening before the negotiations in Maastricht, Mitterrand and Andriotti had dinner together and they decided to put a date on the Euro project. Now, the Dutch were the president of the Maastricht Treaty, which had a sort of unfortunate history. So the Dutch were a bit, they could not do anything against that. The Germans were, of course, already committed to the Euro and to Mitterrand. So the whole discussion about the order was circumvented in that dinner by Mitterrand and Andriotti of putting a date, 1999. It became 2001, two years later, but that circumvented the debate about the process and which country yes and which country no. So yes, Euro, but this is how it went and see the consequences, Italy, still a problem. Um, <coughs> the ECB, uh, the Dutch very much wanted a, uh, an independent, apolitical European Central Bank not playing a role in uh, bailing out. There's quite a bit of uh, frustration over the ECB at the moment. I will be very quick about these points. There's a lot to say about it. No bailout. See where we are. 
Um, under Barroso, if I remember correctly, the Dutch were against a globalization investment fund of half a billion. <coughs> Juncker proposed his FC fund, which is very much the same as the globalization fund. We were against, the Dutch were against uh, the, the half a billion in 2009. Juncker proposed 315 billion, and now we have the doubling of that uh, Juncker funds. So you see things are moving. Um, <clears throat> the Dutch were against the European Monetary Fund around early 2000s, uh, 2010s. Uh, then it was trans the, the, the origin of the discussion we now have was the European uh, Financial Stability Facility. The Dutch wanted to have the term facility, not the F of fund at the end. Then it became the ESM, and now we have proposals of the full-blown EMF on the table. The Dutch were also against the ESM to be part of a back backstop for banks. Again, that is now on uh, the table. Um, the Dutch wanted to have independent supervision on the European semester by the Commission, and even pushed for reversed qualified majority voting so that the Commission has even m more independence and power to, do, to make statements about the economic situations in member states and wh what they should be doing. Reverse qualified majority voting. There was a Finn Olli Rehn who had a sort of circum, uh, uh, DG Ekvin parts working on the European semester with Chinese walls around it. That was Barroso Olli Rehn. I did a chapter on that for a book project. By the time that chapter came out in the book, all Iran was gone, and Juncker and Moscovici were negotiating in the front pages of the Financial Times with Hollande about what to do. So this idea of an independent commission became a sort of strongly political, in the words of Juncker, a very political commission in the hands of Juncker and Moscovici. So this independent supervision uh, is, is, is getting out of sight, even to the paradox that we have given the new political commission reverse qualified majority voting, almost independence, or no control. Um, independence of the commission is something that really comes back a lot in the discussions about uh, supervision, and the trust in the commission is not really very high at the moment. Uh, independent commission and spits and candidaten, that doesn't go uh, together very well. In, the in relation to the independent commission, uh, the Dutch have been strong proponents of uh, pushing for better regulation, meaning impact assessments, assessing what are the proposals, what are the costs and benefits, uh, what alternatives, what instruments to use, how to evaluate the policies in the end, so that it is made, it's not apolitical, but at least that you have the foundations of your political decisions on the basis of better regulation arguments. Better regulation, as far as I can see it, has been suffering tremendously under Juncker and Timmermans. And we have to acknowledge in the Netherlands that Timmermans, responsible for better regulation, or, uh, of course, comes from the Netherlands. Um, just about FC, the investment program of Juncker, Juncker has been going around to state that these, this major investment program is a huge success. But on what basis is he saying this? He's going around saying it's a big success, and we don't know on what basis. There's even a Bruegel uh, 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 a think tank in the Brussels report saying well, the money is spent, which is what Juncker calls a great success, but it doesn't lead to new investments, only 2%. So we have a president's commission probably claiming a success of, and we don't really know on what basis. So better regulation would be, we know what the facts are. So the, the, the Dutch uh, better regulation agenda is, uh, is going out of the window. No enlargement. You know that um, uh, Juncker is now um, proposing that for the euro and the eurozone. Um, no taxation, no European taxes. And we see the proposal coming out. What we see is this European system is drifting into 
things that we think we agree on something, that's what we put to our public, and we vote for in Parliament, and then it moves in different kinds of directions. That is something that is, is a worrying sign. This is the sort of pragmatism and compromise making in the EU that has a slightly frustrating angle in the Dutch debate about what is it that we are actually agreeing on if in a couple of years from now it is d different than we are discussing at this stage. So that's the, the, my second point was about the, the drift of European uh, integration, the trend that we see. And the trend is also one of, in a way, a more mature European integration system with the Commission developing into a political body uh, with an elected president and more powers to the European Parliament. Now, um, the um, narrative in the, in the Netherlands. First, let me say a few things about the, the narrative where we are now with European integration. It seems to be that the current trend is one of uh, haste. Uh, we have to uh, fix the roof uh, when the sun is shining. Um, the, uh, apparently, there's a new crisis looming, so we have to uh, move fast. Um, uh, we have to use windows of opportunity at the moment. So this is the sort of haste narrative. Uh, and we see Juncker has been, the Commission has been very active with producing proposals and, and telling us also the EU has to deliver and we have to deliver now. So we have to be ambitious and we have to be ambitious now. So this, the EU narrative is probably one of haste uh, and political pressures. The political pressures come from, of course, Juncker, but also come very much from Macron and uh, uh, somebody like uh, Martin Schulz, who just left the political stage, but he had a big influence of the past year in the developments in Germany. Um, so it's all about haste and political pressures. And there's also something in this current development of the EU of um, uh, it has to be a package. We have to have a big win-win package for everybody. Uh, but that makes it very hard to talk about the individual items because the, the, the big package running up to the European elections in 2019 is, of course, uh, we want to offer something to the public that everybody will be happy with. So it has to be about investments. It has to be about a modern European uh, budget with innovation. Uh, you know, you name it, it's in that package. But that makes it very hard, particularly for smaller countries, to actually start to question some things in that package. But if, if you do, then let's say there is something like tax harmonization in that huge package, a win-win for everybody. If Ireland doesn't want it, you will veto the whole package. And that's very tough to do in the European environment where all the other countries will uh, probably be blaming you. The Netherlands, we, we know a lot about that, but so do you with the outcomes of referenda. Um, so that's the development in the EU of haste, political pressure, and looking for a win-win overall package. Now the Dutch narrative. Um, <clears throat> the Dutch narrative, uh, the Dutch seem to have a reputation of being EU critical. And uh, uh, to some extent, that, that impression is uh, also created by the media, because when we have elections, then I get a lot of questions from journalists from outside the Netherlands, and uh, particularly last March when we had the elections, I got really annoyed, and I also started to tell it to journalists. All the questions were about one person, Geert Wilders. Uh, it's about 15% of our voters voted for Geert Wilders. I mean, it, that, of course, creates a certain... We have a lot more to discuss in the Netherlands than that. Fundamentally, the Netherlands is very pro-European. We're almost, with the Irish, sort of high in the rankings uh, for pro-European. We are very much a, a, an economic trading nation. You know, I don't think th there's a serious debate about an exit, just like there's none here like that. But um, in the Netherlands, I think... Uh, people want to know what kind of Europe are we creating. Now, the Dutch narrative at the moment is one of, uh, 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 if I look at the words of, of, uh, of Mark Rutte, is one of, we want an EU of strong member states. Uh, and why is that? Because we don't want people to look at the EU for help. The countries have to 
help themselves or have the abilities to do that. They have to reform. Um, uh, if you also, if you look at the charts, you can see that there are about seven, eight countries that trust themselves very much. But it also means that there are about 20 countries that particularly look at the EU for help and don't trust themselves. And that's sort of awareness in the Netherlands. We're in a smaller group of countries that, that trust themselves and look at themselves, whereas the other countries look at the EU. And this also makes it very difficult to listen to Juncker when he says people have to regain trust in the EU. The problem, the, the, the diagnosis in the Netherlands is that there's not a lack of trust in the EU, there's a lack of trust in the member states themselves. That's the thing to look at. So the, the Dutch narrative is different from, let's say, the Juncker narrative of people have to regain trust in the EU. We think people have to regain trust in themselves, in, the, in their own governments. Uh, so that's an important element uh, in the Dutch um, narrative. Uh, Rutte and the gov this government and previous governments also look at the EU for, of course, open markets, for international relations, for security, and, and uh, all the rest of it. But the, the, this idea of a Europe of strong member states is really key in the Dutch uh, debate. And uh, when you look at the reforms that, that you did uh, during the crisis, which were phenomenal, the Dutch also did major reforms. Huh? And we didn't even have so much external pressure. We did it you know, by ourselves, more or less. Somebody in the European Commission called the Dutch the masochists of Europe. Uh, you know, whenever we see a crisis, we want to reform ourselves, you know, voluntarily. Uh, so that's the sort of, that's what we expect from uh, the, the, the Europe, the Europe that is a um, uh, build on member state. The Netherlands is also highly pragmatic, and that becomes rather problematic, because we want to sit at any table, well, all the tables. We, we have you know, no opt-outs, as far as I, I know. I'm looking at an uh, expert on the Netherlands. I, I don't think that we have opt-outs. We want to sit on, any, on all the tables. We had an opt-out this year on EPO, which is the European Public Prosecutor's Office, uh, where the Dutch government said, well, we don't have to take part in everything. EU commissioners were telling me, uh, commission officials were telling me, you will join in three months. And they were right, now we are. We have agreed that we will join. So we are very pragmatic. We also, we also very much, uh, of, of, uh, you know, we are a polder society. We, we negotiate. And we do that at the European level. So we are, I think we're all, we, we're, we, we will, there will not be strong, in the end, not be strong opposition from the Netherlands. Uh, and it, so we are also pragmatic. That's uh, the point I want to make. Uh, yet... Now, and I think that has to do with Macron and Schulz, uh, we are back uh, to something that I did not expect. Uh, there's a new narrative now in the, in the Netherlands, and that is a, a, a tougher European narrative. That is one of no transfer union, but also uh, member states should not expect uh, support from the EU. Uh, so the, the if then, if you reform, then you will get something from the EU. That is now, Jorutte said, we don't want that kind of Europe anymore. You know, if countries want to reform, they have to do it because they want it themselves, not because they get uh, support from the EU. So we get a tougher line. I did not expect this because the Dutch government um, learned an important lesson from the third rescue package to Greece, where Rutte told in his election campaign in 2012, there will be no more money going to Greece. That was probably the uh, election slogan of, of Rutte, no more money to Greece. But in 2015, there was the th third rescue package, so he had to apologize in parliament. And that was the lesson the government learned, don't make big statements, because you have to go back to parliament and apologize. So I was expecting from this new government no major statements on Europe. But in December, Rutte really did it by these statements. He, 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 no transfer union and no if-then uh, arrangements anymore. Why did he do that? Now, I think that really has a lot to do with Macron and Schulz's remark that uh, uh, we want to have the ever closer union and the countries that don't want it, they should leave. That was a sort of... The end of pragmatism for Rutte. Rutte is a, prime, is a very pragmatic person. He wants to you know, talk to everybody and, and as long as possible. But there he had to say, even despite the lesson of no more money to Greece, 
we can't do that. Uh, now, so he, he drew a line. He had a tough uh, statement on, uh, on, um, uh, um, on the EU. A um, lot to say about it, just to, to finalize a couple of, of, of further uh, re remarks. So there's a vision now. Rutte has been avoiding visions, want to, wanted to be pragmatic, the vision. But this also makes it for the Dutch debate very complicated because for this vision, uh, it's highly unlikely that that vision will succeed because the next uh, 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 EU budget, the uh, multi-financial framework, will involve a higher budget. So even there, we will see more of a transfer union. Uh, but also other measures being taken. We will probably get a European monetary fund of some sort. There will be a lot of steps going in directions that actually do not fit with the vision that is now outspoken, uh, spoken out loud in the Netherlands. Uh, so what will happen for this government if there are things that do not fit with the messages being given? That's going to be a tough one for this government. And uh, the next thing which is going to be, uh, the, and that will feed the counter-narrative in the Netherlands. If Rutte has to compromise at the EU level, then we will see Geert Wilders and some others really now becoming more frustrated with this idea of a drifting EU where that is unstoppable. And where does it lead to? <laughs> it's that sort of... This is now the dangerous situation in the Netherlands, that this drifting EU is becoming, is getting the image of being unstoppable and becoming more political, etc. Um, but uh, this government also needs supporters now. The UK is gone. Uh, what other countries does the Netherlands have? So we're very much looking at the coalitions, and the coalitions strategy is, I guess, a very dangerous strategy because coalitions are generally very unreliable and you need many small countries and, um, you know, to get a really strong voice. Uh, it's understandable for the Dutch, of course. We want to be the, 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 bigger of the, the biggest of the smaller countries so that Germany has to listen to us. Or, no, we can understand it. But it's very hard to get coalitions because, as far as I know, Ireland wouldn't be against a higher EU budget, which is very sensitive, of course. Uh, we would like to, to kill agricultural subsidies. I think that would be a different debate here. Uh, um, so that with, with uh, I mean, uh, Austria uh, seems very much on the Dutch line in many ways, but in Austria, I think, as far as I understand, they would not be against European taxes. Uh, so uh, very hard to have actually coalitions and to rely on it. I want to um, uh, end with, uh, with, with um, uh, where I think this discussion stands now and should be going. Um, and this is something where um, um, I also want to hear where, where Ireland stands. Because the way I read the Dutch situation is that the Dutch are very much pro-European. And I think uh, we can easily sell in the Netherlands a transfer union. It's like paying taxes. Uh, as long as you know what you're paying taxes for, you know, people are generally willing to pay the taxes. Uh, and I think that is the same in the Netherlands. But what kind of Europe are we building? See, that is the, the basic question. Uh, is this a political EU that is a, a sort of becoming a, a sort of monster that um, um, uh, suffers from checks and balances? Uh, if we look at the European, um, sort of the, 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 the center of Brussels, I think it's, it's about a, a kilometer by a kilometer, and you have there 30,000 officials from the European Council, the Commission, the European Parliament. There's an office of the ECB. There's, a, I think, an office of the EEB. So what is this? Do we have a system of checks and balances? Is this a mature political system, or is this... Yeah, what, what is it? Um, I was speaking to people in the European Parliament about uh, plans in the Commission, and uh, I had the idea that they were really working very close together with Parliament and Commission on proposals that were being de developed. Is this a system of checks and balances? If we don't have better regulation with good preparation, uh, uh, 
and, and assessments at the end that uh, if this is, is if all of this becomes political in a sort of environment Brussels that becomes in this way intransparent uh, I am not pleading for a more democratic Europe because I don't think this is the issue that we're talking about at the moment the commission is it's there it's a it's a it's a fact of life uh, and it's it's necessary but uh, from a good systems of um, from good political administrative systems we may expect that you have different phases it's the policy preparation phase even before that is the gathering of information it's the policy formulation it's the policy making of the it's the policy implementation and it's policy monitoring and it is policy enforcement all of that now is in the hands of the european commission as far as i can see we need to have i think we need for, to look for inspiration to the nordic countries where you have small ministries and separation of different tasks in the policy process that is a system of checks and balances in the policy process that I think will hugely contribute to the support that this at least is a good system. And that's probably, I really mean probably, one of the difficulties that we have in the Netherlands. What kind of system is it that we are creating? And is this a good system? Is it better than that we have in the Netherlands? Or is it something like we had in... In, in, in Paris in, in, in the 1990s, sort of politically concocted, intransparent uh, system. So, um, um, checks and balances, that is, I think, what we really need to be talking about, that we know what policies are, what good policies are, what monitoring systems there are, what enforcement systems there are, and as a rule, you cannot have all these functions in one hand. We're in one organization. Uh, we need to have much more independence uh, in the different phases uh, from each other. Uh, I think there's an intellectual deficit in the EU that we don't look at that because when I look at the Netherlands, I think the Netherlands could be highly committed to European integration, but we really need to tell what kind of Europe we are creating. And also it should be clear that that is a better Europe than what we have in The Hague because the impression that now exists is that this is a Europe that has been grown and developing pragmatically, but that the time has now come that we look at it and uh, talk about serious reforms, but on a different level than we are having now. Did I stay somewhat within time? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>